All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Let's take our chorus books and sing number eight. Our chorus books, oh, how merciful. When I was lost in sin and shame, how you let me take the blame. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. When I could look down deep within and see the sinfulness of sin, blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. A sinner lost and so hell bent, yet thou sayest I must repent, blessed Lord. How merciful thou wast to me. I wonder why I should rebel with a soul deserving hell. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful. How merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. I'm not ashamed of all thy grace. When thou came and took my place, blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. And when this world ceases to be eternal blood to speak for me, blessed Lord, how merciful thou art to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou art to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou art to me. Mercy's past and his mercy's present, his mercy's future, all in Christ. Let's take our Bibles and look together in Proverbs chapter 3. And I want us to read from verse 21 on verse 25 and speak with you about sound wisdom and discretion. Of course, as we study here through this book of Proverbs, we're seeing this, how it is revealed in Christ Jesus the Lord. We don't look around to men for sound wisdom and discretion. We don't look within ourselves, but we look to Christ. So here, Proverbs 3, verse 21, again, it begins with, My son, this would be the father speaking of his son, Let not them depart from thine eyes, keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul, and grace to thy neck. Then 
shalt thou walk in the way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid, yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of desolation of the wicked, when it cometh, for the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Let's look to the Lord in his direction. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. Thank you also for eyes to see. How often we would have read this particular portion and sought for ways to apply it to ourselves is so often the case in works religion but to read this and not see how the Lord Jesus Christ is the very personification of wisdom and discretion and how you sent him into this world that he might by his perfect life by his obedient death satisfy you the father so that sinners such as we might enjoy the blessings of his work. Oh, to have eyes to see of Christ even now as we prepare to look at this word. And pray that you would indeed by your spirit turn our eyes to him. So we're thankful for this opportunity to meet and pray for your blessing. It's in Christ's precious name I ask this. So again, as we read here, to read these portions of Scripture and miss Christ is to miss everything. Scriptures are not simply a book of wisdom. You can go to the library, you can go to the bookstore and find plenty of men's writings about earthly wisdom, and how to live your life, and how to be careful and moral and upright, all these things. And yet I'm mindful that unless our righteousness exceeds that of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, we shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. We're not accepted before God based upon our morality or our wise living. In fact, I dare say if we can read this portion of scripture and apply it to ourselves, then we already have failed because we stumble daily. We fall daily. And you can say, well, we didn't exercise wisdom, but that's the problem is that we don't have it. This flesh, in this flesh, there dwells no good thing. I believe the Lord even ordains our falls, lest we should ever put confidence in this flesh. The more you strive to walk that straight and narrow, the more the Lord is going to teach you you can't. And therefore, our eyes should not be on ourselves, but on the one who is wisdom and who is discretion. Described here as sound wisdom and discretion. You see, this order that is given here in verse 21 when he says, My son is directed to his son. Because we know that all of Scripture speaks of the glory and honor of the Son of God. And this is the record, John said, that God has given of his son. So when we read this, we see Christ. What was necessary for Christ to accomplish when he came to this earth? It wasn't that he just came down here to prove that he could live a holy life and then ascend into glory. The charge that was given him, just like here, my son, let not them depart from thine eyes. The entire weight and charge of that people that the Father gave him from eternity rested on his accomplishing faithfully exactly what the Father had given him to do. 
God's justice required not just a good shot at it, but perfection in order for him to be the redeemer, the savior, and the justifier. And so this charge laid upon Christ is how I read this, that he never took his eyes off of the glory of his father, even as a child at 12 years of age, there in the temple, answering those men of the law who consider themselves scholars, marveled at his answers. And when Joseph and Mary came seeking him, he said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Here is the charge in the Old Testament that was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ that was necessary for him to fulfill, to be about his father's business. When it says my son, speaking of a relationship there, Christ is eternally the son of God. He didn't become the son of God. Even in coming to the flesh, he took that title, the son of man, but he never ceased being the son of God. And if we want an idea of what it was for him to have this charge laid upon him, that's what I love about reading the Old Testament now. It used to be a closed book. We come here and we see how this would have been laid on him from eternity, but revealed here in time and then fulfilled when Christ actually came. And here's the charge to keep sound wisdom and discretion. If this were given to us as being the condition for us to live a holy life, that we exercise wisdom and discretion in all things pertaining to God, we failed from the start. Adam, in his best state, did not exercise sound wisdom and discretion. He was created upright, but not righteous. There's only one righteous one that was ever created or came in the flesh. That's Christ. That was reserved for him. But to prove that even man in his best state is altogether vanity, Adam, given the option and every favorable situation in his pre-fall state, yet did not exercise wisdom and discretion. And so I ask you, if that was true with Adam, how much more so with us now as depraved creatures? Fallen. Where is wisdom to be found? Where is discretion to be found? It's to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ, in this one of whom it says here, my son, doesn't say my sons, as if it applied to many, but my son. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So the first thing that I would note here is the nature of sound wisdom and discretion in Christ. How would Christ have fulfilled this command that was given him of his father? Well, to have sound wisdom, the word wisdom there can also mean sound doctrine, that everything about him was sound and true and wholesome. When you stop and think about the wholesomeness of Christ, they could find no fault in him. In fact, one time when they sent men to arrest him and they came back empty-handed and those that sent them said, well, why didn't you bring him? What did they say? Never has a man spoken as this man spoke. They had no answer to his wisdom. And I'll tell you, men's works and men's ways have no answer to the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the soundness of it. And we see that revealed in, in the gospel. I said that this word wisdom here can also be sound doctrine. Keep sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Well, it's that which gives God all the glory in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ. If any one of us went out and started preaching ourselves, we would be egotists. 
But when Christ went out preaching himself, such was the command he had received of his father because the father had given him authority over all flesh. And therefore he went declaring as he did, I am the way. Can you imagine someone, I know people try to present themselves that way. Well, I'm the way, I'm the truth. If you're gonna know, you're going to know truth, it's gonna be through me. If you want life, I'm the one that's gonna give it to you. Any man that speaks that way, he's a liar. But when Christ says, I am the way, not just that he came to show the way, I am the truth, not just that he came to teach the truth, and I am the life, all particular articles, John 14, 6. That means apart from him, there is no life. You could write wisdom and discretion on a billboard and stare at it all day and try to understand it and never would. That'd be an interesting billboard to put up, just wisdom and discretion. See what people comment about it. Where's it to be found? In Christ. He said, no man comes to the Father but by me. That's why I know here when it's speaking of sound wisdom and discretion, it's not found within us. And sound doctrine is that which gives Christ all the glory, not only his life, but his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, everything that he is. In fact, if you look over in 2 John, there's only one chapter there, but verse 9, how important is this sound doctrine concerning Christ? It says here, John wrote this, whosoever transgresseth, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. The most people think of transgression is something I violate in here. The standard is the doctrine of Christ. That's the sound wisdom of God. All that he is, all that he came to accomplish, and all the glory belonging unto him, whoever transgressed and abides not in that doctrine, I think of Cain and Abel. They were both taught the same thing by their father, Adam. And that was, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. How do I know that? That's how Abel learned it. Well, how did Abel learn it? He must have learned it from Adam. How did Adam learn it? When God slew those innocent animals and clothed Adam and Eve with the skins as a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ who would come. Therein is the wisdom of God, how God can be just and justified. Cain would have heard the same thing, but Cain sought another way. He did not abide in the doctrine of Christ. And so it is with many today who left to themselves might give lip service to the person and work of Christ and yet devise another way. And what does it say about such? It says they do not have God. I don't care how moral and upright they might appear to men, how kind and gentle. Not to abide in the doctrine of Christ. How vital is this doctrine? How vital is this command laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ to keep sound wisdom? Paul said in Galatians 2 and verse 21, if righteousness come by law, or any ordinance or tradition of man, Christ is dead in vain. If you think that this is a cooperation between Christ keeping sound wisdom and you adding what you can to it so that together we're gonna to make it, you have not God. You have transgressed the very doctrine of Christ. And I reemphasize again, in scripture, Wherever you see doctrines, plural, it's always doctrines of men, doctrines of devils, but never the doctrine. This charge laid upon Christ, the Father laying it upon him is because all the eyes of the Father had ever only been on the Son. Never on man. We're beneficiaries if we're the Lord's. Just as Christ is the testator, we we're beneficiaries. We've been named in that will. 
we receive the benefits of what Christ has accomplished, but it was necessary for him to keep, that word says, keep sound wisdom. If you want to know what keeping sound wisdom is, look at the life of Christ when he was on this earth. From the cradle to the grave, everything about him was an exercise of that wisdom, the very wisdom of God. Talk about a beautiful picture. It's not with what men paint a picture of Christ. It's in this word. It's his character. It's his person. It's his righteousness for our justification. It's our hope in him. It's what he worked out on behalf of sinners such as we are. And that's why it's very distinctly stated here. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. To abide in the doctrine of Christ means that the Spirit of God has turned our eyes to him, away from ourselves. There's no hope in here. And to see him alone as that one who has fulfilled all things that God might be just and justified. There's no room for compromise, just like there wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ. When this charge was laid on him to keep sound wisdom, here in Proverbs 3 and verse 21, and discretion, it was necessary that he work this out on behalf of this people. And now, being given his spirit, we look to him without compromise. And that's why in verse 10, 2 John, it says, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine. Someone says, well, I kind of like our preacher. Why do you like him? Well, he's just a nice man. You know, we haven't had a nice man in a while. The last guy was kind of rough. But what does he have to say? Oh, he preaches about how to get along with your neighbor and he tells us how we ought to be kind and gentle and loving. And, okay, well, that sounds all like works to me. What of Christ? What's his doctrine of Christ? Tell me about it. I want to know if we're talking about the same person. I had that conversation this past week with somebody. I thought we were talking about the same person that we knew. Because the names fit, and for a while, everything, then all of a sudden, I began to think, no, we're, we must not be talking about the same person. When I asked him, oh, no, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about this one. That's how careful we need to be, even with regard to men who use the name of Christ and hold this Bible and preach from it. What is their doctrine concerning Christ? The teaching, the word doctrine means teaching. What is that instruction? Does it match does it fit what this word has to say concerning him if not it sounds pretty severe but it says if there come unto you any and bring not this doctrine receive him not into your house neither bid him god speed don't even say to him good message for he that biddeth him god speed is partaker of his evil deeds you realize there's only one righteousness that God has ever approved, accepted, and that's the righteousness of his son. If it weren't that vital, then this whole book's up for grabs. Everybody have at it, see what you can do. But the reality is that the law was given, not as a means of salvation, but that every mouth might be stopped. And everyone found guilty before God shut up to our own guilt so that Christ in his coming, doing, and dying might be glorified in what he accomplished. So that's the nature of sound wisdom. It's all that pertains to Christ. Christ, the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God. That's what Paul said we preach. Discretion here in Proverbs 3, 21, when it says keep sound wisdom and discretion, that word discretion actually is the word counsel. So what it's saying is that Christ didn't just come down here with a general plan given him by his father when it says, my son, keep sound wisdom and discretion. But keep that which was determined by God's eternal counsel. By the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, 
you by wicked hands have taken and crucified and slain. There wasn't one thing that our Lord did that was not in keeping with discretion in that sense, counsel. Now, if you were to ask me to keep God's counsel, all I know is what's revealed here in the scripture, and I will tell you, I can't even keep what's revealed here, much less know what was determined in eternity past. But herein is the wisdom of Christ exercise, and that when he came, he kept wisdom, knowing his father, knowing what his father required, and he kept counsel. Over in Acts chapter 20, in verse 27, would be a good example of this word here, if you look with me. Acts chapter 20, and verse 27, where Paul speaking here to the Ephesian elders as to how it is they were to conduct themselves in the assemblies over which the Lord had placed them. When it says in verse 20, Paul says, And now, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, that is, in the public places and from house to house. Remember, that in this first century, that's where the church gathered, in houses. They didn't have these monstrosities of buildings that have grown over the years that people call church buildings. That was from house to house. So wherever the church met, notice, testifying both to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God, and or even faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't separate the two. Repentance is faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ is repentance toward God. It's a heart turned away from self to him, and notice, the Father and the Son. All the work is done between the Father and the Son. That's what we're studying here in Proverbs 3. My Son, we're... We're being given an inside look at what must have been from eternity, that counsel determined for that people that the Father gave him that he should come and save. It doesn't matter, Jews or Greeks. Wherever the Lord has led me to preach the gospel on different continents and different cultures over the years, I thank him for the experience. But... I didn't have to study that culture first to determine how it is I was going to communicate the message. My one concern was finding a good translator that could stand up and say exactly what this word said as I preached. That was my one concern. And I had to change a few. I've had some stand up in the middle of the meeting, stop me and say, whoa, wait a minute. He's not saying what you're saying. And then I asked them, well, can you say it better? Because if you can, get up here. We're going to get this guy to sit down. But it's one message, one gospel, one Christ, Jew or Gentile. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the effect of Christ's work there that he accomplished on the cross. His spirit gives that repentance even faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ and those that Christ has redeemed and God the Father is justified. And so Paul emphasizes the importance of this, where he says he knows he's going to Jerusalem and he faces opposition, affliction. But he says in verse 24, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy. What course is he talking about? He's talking about that path on which the Lord had brought him from being lost in religion and a zealot for the law now to preaching Christ and him crucified in his grace and never looking back. I'll tell you, if a man can pick this up and then turn back, he never, he never learned. He never taught of Christ. But he says... And the ministry, that's an important word, that's the word to serve. Those that Christ raises up to preach his gospel, they're not preaching themselves or building their 
works and their legacy. You know, the ministry, the servanthood would be another way of looking at it. That word is actually the word deacon, by the way, in the original. <laughs> when they appointed deacons, these weren't guys in the church that took up the money at the end and made sure the communion table was prepared and did all these menial tasks. No, they were preachers of the gospel. Those that were deacons, to, to deacon meant to minister the gospel. That's what Paul was. He says, which I have received of the Lord Jesus. Notice, it's the same as, as the doctrine of Christ, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He wasn't preaching a grace that was out there for anybody to grab if they just would. He's, he's preaching the distinctive grace of God toward those sinners for whom Christ came and paid the debt. That's why he says in verse 26, wherefore I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. Guiltless. What that means is doesn't matter who walks through that door, they're going to hear of Christ and him crucified. How many times have you in the past walked into a place and Oh, they're on a special theme this time. We're, we're talking about patriotism. We're, we're talking about tithing. Today, we're talking about love your neighbor. Different themes. That's what you find in religious works, congregations. But I'll tell you, the way to be pure of the blood of all men is just simply continue to preach Christ every time. Like one man said to me after he'd listened for a few weeks and no longer tense, but this was back in the beginning when we were still meeting up at Centenary College at Smith Auditorium. Brought his family, he had a large family. But after about three visits, he asked me at the door, he said, so is this all we're gonna hear? And I said, that's all we're gonna hear. Never saw him again. I run into him every once in a while. But I'll tell you, that's, that's quite a statement. For someone to say, is this all we're going to hear? When all we're going to hear has to do with Christ and his glory and what he accomplished. But verse 27 is where we see this word discretion as far as counsel. Paul says, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All the will of God, all the purpose of God, all that he in his wisdom and discretion has determined to be. Back years ago, when the Lord first taught me of Christ and stopped me dead in my tracks, and I came back to the United States to the congregation that had sent me out. And at that point, the other preacher they considered me one of their pastors. So when I was there, then we shared the pulpit. The other preacher would preach, and I'd preach, and other preacher, and then I'd preach. And it didn't take long for them to realize that the man that they had sent out isn't the same man that came back from Africa. And I'll tell you, they saw every way they could to shut my mouth. With promises on one hand and threats on the other, this went on for about a year. And I can remember, still remember, the other preacher asked me to come over to his house. He said, we've got we to gotta come to one mind on this. And I still remember him taking out a blank piece of paper and sitting down at his kitchen table drawing a big old circle. And he said to me, this is the whole counsel of God, this circle right here. And then he took, it's, it's hard to believe when I think back about it, he, then he took a, his pencil and he put a little dot in the middle he said, that's Christ. And that's what you're doing. You're focused on this little time. That's when I pulled back. He knew he had never been taught of Christ. How on earth did you relegate Christ to being a little guy? And all this other, for him, it was preaching character, man's character. Go back and do character studies throughout. Let's do the study the character of Ruth. Let's study the character of David. I'll tell you one thing about their character. They were characters. They were dead dog sinners apart from Christ and his work. When Paul says here, I've not shunned to declare unto you the 
all the counsel of God. That means he had but one message. I know it because over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said it. It wasn't that he couldn't preach on other things. Try to build a big audience. You'll build an audience, but as one preacher told me one time, be careful what you use to attract people in, because what you use to attract them in, you're going to have to keep using to keep them. I'll tell you, I know of only one message that is going to attract God's sheep. And that's really who we're after. On the trail of God's sheep. And that's Christ and Him crucified. Christ as being the whole counsel of God. So much so that Christ Himself said that Father judges no man but has given all judgment into His hand. We're not going to stand before any but Christ one day. I say stand. We're not going to bow. There's not going to be anybody standing. Bowing before Christ who is all of the Father's glory. All of that eternal counsel had but one view, and that was to glorify his Son. How much does God think of his Son? Everything. And it means nothing for him to cast a whole nation into hell if that's what pleases his Son. Whatever his Son bidding is, to save whom he will and condemn whom People don't think in terms like him. He's the king. He's sovereign. Who am I? If God created me just to be nothing but fodder for hell, he'd be just in doing so. Look around you. The fact that we're sitting here actually rejoicing in this message right now and wanting nothing but Christ, that doesn't come from in here. That's the good pleasure of God that's part of that Eternal counsel that determined that I as a sinner should know, even know something of his son. And be found in him, as Paul said, not having my own righteousness, but that which is of God, by faith. We receive it, we see it by faith. But it's accomplished in this person. And over here in 1 Corinthians 2, that's what Paul declared. He said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. One day he could talk about other things. Verse 2, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's his person and that's his work. You want the sum of sound doctrine? You want the sum of sound wisdom? You want the sum of discretion, the whole counsel of God? It's in those two phrases. Jesus Christ his person and him crucified and how heavily did it weigh on Paul he said I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling it wasn't that he feared the audience but he feared God the weight of what it is to stand and declare Christ in his glory he says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. That's not how he put his messages together, thinking how he could alliterate his outline. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. The Father is determined that all the glory be to the Son. The Spirit does nothing but bring glory to the Son. Not just in knowledge, but in power, bringing home who Christ is to the heart. Verse 5, that your faith should not stand, notice, in the wisdom of men, but in the very power of God, that power which reveals Christ to sinners such as we are. So this is what the Lord God great, laid upon Christ in this charge that... He should come and fulfill all these things to the honor and glory of his Father. I intended to get further than verse 21 of Proverbs 3, but we'll have to pick up next time and look at what we've dealt with just now, just the nature of that sound wisdom and discretion in Christ. Next time we'll take a look at the effects of that sound wisdom and discretion, where 
produces life and grace where it kept our Lord even from falling. While men set snares, there was nothing that would cause him to fall because that very wisdom and counsel of his father corrected everything he did say. And the results in peace and security, all of these things that we read here are the effects of Christ's work on behalf of those sinners for whom he came, lived, and died. Lord willing, we'll take a look at that next time. We'll be back here in just a few.